last night at the or towards the end of the lecture or the Dharma talk there was some uh, discussion partly based on Iko's comments on Nirodha Nirodha which is cessation Please. cessation Nirodha is like it's the so-called so ninth jhana so like uh, the cessation of perception and feeling uh, which I have never exp experienced in a sustained way, perhaps in blips, but Nirodha Samapatti, which is like this state where you can, a sustained state of cessation, where you can stay for, a, like Lee described in the lecture, for, a, yeah, he mentioned a monk who he believed might have been in Nirodha for a day or two or three days, you know, nothing, absolutely nothing, there's nothing there, just pure consciousness, just, just Pure awareness, not of, of, of anything, not of nothing, not without any object, just like no object at all, nothing there, just consciousness basically. But in uh, some of the Vedic schools, for example, the Sankhya Karika school, they were called Purusha, Purusha, which is like primordial consciousness. In Sankhya Karika, they have this model that the world is built out of Purusha and Prakriti. Purusha is consciousness and Prakriti is the dance of form, this illusion of form. I know one person, I, uh, like one uh, guy called Ari, Aritya Paranjape, he's an Indian meditator, he's, uh, he writes with a Reddit username Adivader, Adivader on Reddit. He's a very cool guy. Uh, he's very, very, very skilled in meditation. Like he's the, I don't know anyone who's even really even close to as good at Samatha practice as he is. He can go to any jhana out of the, all the eight, eight jhanas, just like, he just, you know, there. Meditates like, I think like four hours per day, has done so for several years, but very good techniques, somehow very good mind, very able mind in some sense. Um, yeah, he, he, he can do Nirodha. So it, it's possible to, I, I know a person, I know, I know it's possible to enter into prolonged states of cessation. That you, everything is gone. Nothing there anymore. No senses, no thoughts, no nothing. And uh, yeah, Iko mentioned this last night and that got, got me thinking about, I mentioned this also in the, like, uh, as the answer, like answering Iko. That um, basically, when I described the, the idea of the good yesterday and how subjective it is and so on and so forth, you can project it onto anything. Perhaps the Buddha, or like someone in the, the compiler of the Pali Canon, or like someone in the Theravadin tradition, thought it to be a very great idea to basically think or project. Uh, in, in, in my words, of course, this is not how they have, would have thought about it, perhaps, but in practice, projecting the idea of goodness, seeing goodness and beauty in cessation. That cessation, nirodha, is beautiful. That's good. The lack of anything. There's nothing there that's perfect. Um... Nirodha is like the basically the culmination of equanimity, so balance and stability, detachment, detachment, equanimity, upekka. That's like the, the pinnacle of, of upekka. And the fourth jhana, which also is like a state of very high upekka, the Buddha actually calls in the Pali Canon the beautiful. Like it's the only jhana with a name, the beautiful, and that that's kind of you know also uh, I took as a, as inspiration for this kind of train of thought. Um, I started thinking about basically two kinds of nirvana, two kinds of nibbana, two kinds of liberation in a, in a very ultimate sense. And this is going to be pretty far out, more far out than, than yesterday's lecture has to be. Yeah, but, but it's like, a, yeah, I, I just had to do it anyhow. Yeah, two kinds of nirvana. How does the Buddha kind of describe Nibbana in the suttas? Or like how is Nibbana described? It's the unconditioned, 
the deathless, the unfabricated, the unborn, and many people for a long time have taken this to mean nirodha, cessation. Nothing there. There's nothing left by which it could be conditioned. It cannot die because it's nothing. It cannot be born because it's nothing. It cannot, it, it, it's not fabricated because there's nothing there that has been fabricated. It's completely free of all fabrication. The cessation is nirvana, nibbana. Nirvana in Sanskrit, nibbana in Pali. And some traditions, for example, the Mahasi school of, of insight practice, which does a lot of noting practice, just kind of trying to notice things as fast as possible. Right? Just noticing things, just noticing. That's the, basically the, the core of the practice. In the Mahasi tradition, uh, they have this thing called the progress of insight, a kind of map of the progress of insight. Some people here know about this. Not all, all of you know, so I'll kind of explain it in very, in kind of very briefly. So uh, it has its roots in the Visuddhi Magga, which is the, basically the biggest commentarial book in the, in the Theravada tradition, the biggest book after the Pali Canon in, the Thera, in Theravada Buddhism, the Visuddhi Magga, compiled by this monk called Buddha Gosha, somewhere like in 200 after Christ, 200 CE. Mm. And in the Visuddhi Magga, they have, for the first time, they have this map, the progress of insight. It has these, uh, I think it's 18 kind of stages of, of insight. I'm not an ex expert on the map because I've never bought into it very, very much because I find that, you know, maps are just models. You know, you can have all kinds of maps. And like that map, that this particular map has these things called the Dukkanyanas, the knowledges of suffering in the middle of it. This kind of, you know, as stages of the path, you get into these states where um, you, you have these stages where you think everything is just terrible. You're super, super depressed, super anxious, in much, much pain because everything sucks so much. And because that's such an unpleasant sounding territory, uh, I've been, always thought that the map is kind of, you know, like, I don't want to go there. <laughs> like, you know, that doesn't sound like a very good map. And the Buddha also, like the Mahasi tradition, which uses this, this map, uh, the Mahasi tradition is uh, founded by this Burmese monk called Mahasi Sayadaw. Sayado means a, a wise person or like, like a guru, a wise man. Uh, and Mahasi is uh, where the place where he was born. Mahasi Sayado is the wise man from Mahasi. Uh, Mahasi Sayado, a Burmese monk, he taught the progress of insight map and this technique of noting practice, this technique of, of insight, which is called dry insight. It has no samatha there. It, it does not aim to have any well-being. No metta, no jhanas, nothing like that. You know, just straight to insight practice and this very deconstructive, very particular kind of insight practice. It's not the kind of insight practice, you know, that I, for example, uh, guided today, for example. It, it, it's more like, a, yeah, noting practice. Many of you might know this. Um, and yeah, the Buddha in the Pali Canon already kind of says, that, you know, there are two routes to Nibbana. Uh, one is very pleasant and one is very unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and I, I, I kind of thought, yeah, yeah, the dry insight, is, it, it is kind of the unpleasant, yeah. And the Buddha, yeah, the point there that Buddha says in the Pali Canon is that one route is directly towards the insight and one route is through samatha and then insight, basically. So there's like insight or there's, you know, samatha with, uh, insight with samatha. Anyhow, in that progress of insight map, uh, awakening or enlightenment, is preceded by this experience of cessation. It's like the, the map says that you know there's this moment called the Magga Pala, which means path fruition. Pala is fruit and Magga is path or way. Magga Pala, the fruit of the path, which is like a, a basically a momentary a blip in which the mind, very equanimous mind, the mind in super high like equanimity, very disenchanted with the world turned away from the world, nothing matters, it's just, you know, everything sucks, nothing matters, kind of, you know, relinquishes reality for a moment, and there's a blip of cessation, nothing there, and then it restarts, 
And that experience, they say, that's an, a taste of Nibbana. That taste of cessation is taste of Nibbana, and that that awakens a person. So that's kind of that's one of the very classical classical descriptions of, of a route to awakening, how awakening progresses. And many, many, many people in the West nowadays, uh, primarily because of uh, Daniel Ingram, who's like one of uh, like he's a pretty famous Western Dharma teacher. Um, he uh, he kind of uses this map and noting practice, and he has popularized this kind of uh, idea that this is how awakening works. You will go through a progress of insight. You have the dukkhanyanas there, the, the the misery states. There's knowledge of disgust, knowledge of misery, and knowledge of fear. I think three of these really bad states. You go through all of that, and then you have a magapala experience, cessation, leap of cessation, and then you get like a level of awakening. Level up. And then you do it again, level up, and then you're just gonna you know, have this, you know, cycle, inside cycles. This idea, and that's not the way I've gone at all. Like I personally have not done that at all. My path has been very different, but I feel a lot of liberation. And so, for a time, I felt that you know, like, what the hell are they talking about? You know, like that sounds like. Uh, that sounds like the wrong way to me. Like you know, it, it doesn't sound like the right way at all. Uh, but then yesterday, last night, I kind of realized that oh yeah, makes sense. That too is a way. Two ways to nibbana, two ways to, to, to nirvana, two kinds of nibbana. Because there are two things that are unconditioned, deathless, unborn, unfabricated. One is nothingness. And one is everything. One is cessation, nirodha. Nirodha is unfabricated, unconditioned, unborn, so on. And the other one is suchness. Suchness is unconditioned, unborn, unfabricated, deathless. Because suchness, the world of form, basically what would, in, in a very wide sense, could be called samsara, so the cycle of rebirth, cycle of existence. Uh, as the Buddha also says, samsara has no beginning, no end. Yeah. He also kind of like agrees, yeah, deathless, you know, unborn. This suchness is never other than suchness. I probably talked about this on one of the talks. I can't remember, but at least like. November, I think I talked about this when I last did a retreat, presidential one, and on my March online retreat. But uh, yeah, this is the way I, I, I have often understood Nibbana. It's basically the same as suchness. So suchness is always just suchness. It's beyond all description. It does not change. Suchness is always just such. It's always suchness. Objective reality. Reality is always just this. It appears to change. It behaves in certain ways, but it has never been born. It will never die. It's completely unconditioned. The only things that are conditioned are the parts we think we see in such. So, for example, a glass is conditioned. It can break, for example. But of course, in suchness, there is no glass. The glass is a sankara, it's a concept, it's a fabrication. Suchness is not composed of parts at all. Form, rupa, is not composed of parts. It's just one big hole. The only parts there are the ones we project. They're just concepts, you know, like microphone, glass, phone, and so on. We make it into parts, that's conceptualization. Suchness itself has no parts. Suchness is a whole unchanging, unborn, deathless, unconditioned. Nothing can kill suchness. Nothing can kill existence in this wide, the whole, the universe, even if all matter was destroyed. There would still be the nothingness that remains. There would still be suchness, basically. There would still be perhaps space time, who, like depending on how how our you know how our ontology works, how physics works. Physics is the 
basically the a description of suchness in some sense. It's a, again a description, so it's not identical to suchness. Suchness does not have electrons, etc., etc. Suchness is just suchness. But physics describes, and always description here, not that map is not the territory, but it's a description of how suchness behaves. Depending on our physics, yeah, we don't know yet how suchness behaves exactly, but uh, not all of it by any means. Um, but it might be that even without matter, there's still space time. The space time continu can continuum still exists. There's the void, the so called zero point field, for example. There's still energy in the void, in the physical void. Suchness cannot be killed. And suchness is always such. It's not, con uh, it's not conditioned. It's always what it is, and nothing more. And yeah, because of this, I have always thought that, yes, suchness is Nibbana. And that's what I also feel. And that's, it makes perfect sense to me. It makes perfect sense in every way. Seeing emptiness and seeing that suchness is just such. All of the things I've talked about, seeing emptiness liberates. Yeah, it does liberate. No need to suffer in this. But yeah, it's just one. Just one of those two. Two things, both unconditioned, both deathless, both unfabricated. There's nothingness and there's everything, suchness. And I, I would say, liberation can be based on either one. You can either love everything and live existence, live in this varied world, this which could be, you know, in, in some Hindu traditions they say it's the dream of Shiva, whatever, like the, the, this, this thing, whatever, this such, whatever it is, whatever it is, you know, whatever, who made it up, I don't know, you know, maybe someone made it up, maybe it's always been just such, maybe it's always been there and no one created it, who knows, but this thing, and either live in this without suffering, knowing that all suffering comes from conceptualizations again, comes from interpretations, mistake, always a mistake, like I said last, last night, and love it. And in that love, find liberation, find that beauty, the idea of the good, like I said, projecting the idea of the good to the world, to the universe, that liberation. I described it yesterday very much, but one can also find liberation in cessation, in that nothingness. Because if one loves nothing but nothingness, basically, literally, someone says, nothing is good. Both meanings of this, you know. The Theravadan Arhat in the classical descriptions. Last night I thought, I thought it's an aversive path, and it is aversive in some sense. It turns away from the world, but there's a point to that. It's not the route I have taken, and I, I, I don't think people have to take it because, yes, two kinds of nirvana, both are liberation. But that is also a path. One can get disenchanted with everything. With the same insight of emptiness, like two routes to take. One can either be like, you know, ah, everything is empty, so I don't have to suffer, I can just find beauty. Nice, liberation. Or one can say that nothing is, is, is ugly, nothing is bad, nothing is good either, nothing matters, and close down. And then there's the then there's cessation. And when Giving that cessation, as the Buddha says, with the fourth jhana of, of equanimity, and like he, he describes nirvana, nibbana, you know, it's beautiful. In this chants, I have, for example, it says, Empty are all fabricated things, arising and passing phenomena, they arise just to fall away. Liberation from them is the greatest bliss. This liberation of cessation, the greatest bliss. Perhaps this is, is what the Buddha, the Buddha's root, different from mine. Maybe I'm not a Buddhist. Hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. A kind of Buddhist, perhaps, but maybe the Buddha's root was this. Attach the idea of the good to nothing. Nothing is good. And then nothing becomes good. That nothingness, that unclenching, that liberation from everything, that refuge, 
like the Buddha says in Nibbana, the supreme refuge, that place becomes the best. That's perfection. And there's nothing that's perfect. So you project perfection onto nothingness. And that makes a lot of sense because then after death, you know, the Buddha is like, you know, yeah, I mean, you could get reborn again and again into this life, into, into samsara. But if you nope out of it, knowing that, you know, like uh, the Buddha obviously like seems, seems like he believed that after death, he can be reborn. Like basically in the Buddhist cosmology in general, in all the schools, there's this wide kind of idea that you get reborn where you want to. After death, whatever you want, whatever you desire, that will affect your re rebirth. And, and the Buddha says, want nothing and get reborn in nothing. And see then that nothing as desirable, as likable. The idea of the good there, it's likable. And voila, it becomes nothing but good. It's like perfect goodness. The cessation becomes perfect goodness. If you see nothing as beautiful, nothing is beautiful, then nothing is beautiful. Nothingness is beautiful. Nothingness is likable. It's desirable. You want nothing. If you, if you don't want anything, you want nothing. And then you get nothing. And it's perfect. You're happy. Yeah, I got nothing. Yay! I'm free. I'm in perfect beauty. I'm in perfect perfect goodness and that's I feel that 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 well might be what the, what the Buddha kind of meant there is like you know you turn away from everything you get repulsed by everything the body all beauty you and that's why Theravada Buddhism is so aversive perhaps that is my interpretation but perhaps yeah it's this root yeah you detach from everything so as to get to this very 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 unconditioned place after you die, no matter you know, if it's annihilation or if you get reborn in cessation, you know, it's the same thing. In any case, you get exactly what you want, which is nothing. You kind of win 100% always. You can lose. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the kind of the, the idea there. Mm. That's the Arhat's liberation, we could say. Um, and then, then, you know, Mahayana sprung about in roughly, you know, um, 200 years of the Pali Canon, you know, in the zeros, 200 CE, so on, developing further and further, up until around, I think, 800 uh, CE or 1200 CE or something, when India was conquered by uh, the Mughal uh, Muslim conquerors and Buddhism was completely er eradicated from India. Northern India had, yeah, Mahayana was the, was the big, big line there. And the Mahayana ideal is no longer the Arhat. No longer the Arhat who kind of, you know, practices so as to attain cessation and then to relinquish everything and then fall away from some samsara into the bliss of annihilation. The only good they see, the only good there is. Very valid route, no, no problem in that. But in Mahayana, the ideal is, is different. It's the Bodhisattva so-called bodhisattva, the awakened being or the awakening being. So in Mahayana scriptures, the, the ideal is that uh, uh, one does not relinquish everything, one does not relinquish samsara, existence, and just get reborn in cessation, or basically get annihilated, the same thing pretty much. Uh, but instead, one keeps on being, one intentionally gets reborn. After death, one pursues a rebirth, as a great teacher, a great sage, one pursues a rebirth in which one can do much good. One sticks around to help people, to help others. And the Mahayanists blame, blamed the Theravada uh, Arhats, the, the, what they call the Hinayana, the lower vehicle, that they're selfish. That the Arhat ideal is selfish. And in a sense, yeah, it is selfish. There's, but there's nothing wrong, I would say there's nothing wrong with that selfishness. If you look at that, there's, the, there's a book called the, the Diamond Sutra. It's one of the foundational book, books in Zen, the Diamond Sutra. It's a very short sutra, it's a very, and a very prominent Mahayana text. But it has a kind of like a, thera, it's a very early text and it has a kind of Theravadan I feel, feel to it in a sense. Because it says, there are no beings to liberate. There never were. 
no beings to liberate, just concepts, you know, just fantasies. There never were any beings to liberate, everyone is already liberated, you can just, you know, go where, you know, just, you know, go to hell if you want, go where, wherever you want, you know. Mm. Yeah, in that perspective, if you take that perspective, no beings to liberate, never were, all of that is just fantasy, then the selfishness of the Arhat is kind of, you know, equally as good as the Bodhisattva's ideal, you know. Because it's, there's nothing objectively good, again, there's nothing objectively good in saving people or helping other people. There's nothing objectively good in it. It's just as, you know, just a canvas for, for projection. So the Arhat is kind of like, you know, yeah, I find that the best thing to do is to, you know, just nope out and get a cessation, annihilate, I get what I want. Perfect, perfect goodness. The only thing I want, the only thing on which I project, project goodness. Nothing. Um, and the, yeah, but the Mahayanists, yeah, they say, yeah, selfish. And it is selfish. No problem with it, but it is, it's selfish. The Mahayana ideal instead finds this other, other type of Nibbana in some sense. Yeah, you get reborn again and again, but you find freedom, liberation in samsara, in the cycle of existence, in being reborn and again, again and again to help others liberate. And the Bodhisattva vow basically is that I will, I vow not to get liberated. I will not get liberated in the Arhat, Ar Arhat sense before everyone else is liberated first. So a very, very long project, you know, <laughs> very long project. And it has this element, even though that, that too, the Bodhisattva vow kind of has the idea that, yeah, okay, if everyone agrees, if we all want cessation, if everyone is, is, is in agreement, we all want to push the button, close it down, show's over, <laughs> there's nothing anymore. And that's bliss. Then, like, then the Bodhisattva <coughs> would be like, okay, I'm in. But until there, like, if there's even one single part of suchness that still exists, basically, which means it wants to exist, Suchness, but in, in this cosmology, and this is a particular kind of cosmology, but in this rebirth kind of thing, the idea is that uh, you know, if a part of suchness no longer wants, if a being no longer wants to reincarnate, then they get to cessation. Uh, when they relinquish, relinquish life completely, they get to cessation. Uh, so basically, the Bodhisattva says, as long as even a single part of suchness still exists, meaning a, even a single part of suchness still wants to exist, I'm in. I will be the last one to go. So, uh, yeah, that's ca that's the their interesting, yeah, very unselfish ideal. And again, selfishness and unselfishness, they sound here like, you know, one would be better than, than the other, but the point is that neither one is really, I can't find that either one is better than the other, in some sense. Because, the view of emptiness, it would be right to say, yeah, there's no reason to save others, no reason to help others. Why would you, why would you help others? They don't, no one suffers really, it's just a dream. It's in a sense, it's all just a fantasy, just a dream. And uh, yeah, the Mahayanist is like, <sighs> wants to change the dream, likes the dream, and wants to just make it a good dream. Kind of, yeah, and that's the kind of the, the, the gist of it. How to decide between these two? Like I am, I have always kind of my path has always been much much closer to the Bodhisattva ideal. Like I have always found it. Like ever since I started meditation, meditation, I have like maybe I had a, like a short period where I felt like this kind of you know cultivating this aversion or I was revulsion towards reality, like not liking reality. Like for a moment maybe I tried to do that, but I kind of soon found that, you know, I, I don't like it. You know, like why would I cultivate not liking? I like to like. Why wouldn't I just like more? And just let go of the, st of the stuff I don't like. And that, that, that be that's the, you know, my style of liberation. And that's, yeah, I think that is the Bodhisattva way in some sense. Yeah. 
but it's very interesting though. Like you know, this morning after I had thought about this, this morning I did not attain Nirodha Samapatti. <laughs> like 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 uh, <laughs> like uh, uh, I tried in, in some sense, and I got into like a ve- like like when I try this method, like you know, just like you know, really focusing on this style, of, this part of emptiness, like this very kind of clear cut. You know, nothing is good, nothing is good. Just kind of focusing on that. Like really, really, really strong equanimity though. Like very, very, very strong states. And I mean, it is beautiful. It, it is nice. Yeah, it is nice. Upeka, as those here who have done Upeka practice or fourth jhana, they know it is nice. It's nice. That stillness, that, that quietness is nice. So in this sense, on one of the talks, maybe the first one, I mentioned these kind of two, two things. Erotic states, thanatic states. Eros and thanatos. The drive to death, drive to life to love. We could say there's an erotic liberation, which is the liberation Robert Bayer, for example, teaches. Obviously, like, like he's probably he's, he's definitely the kind of the one could even say maybe the the one person in, in the modern world who kind of discovered or rediscovered erotic liberation. And then there's the fanatic liberation. That just wants to die, wants to get to annihilation. And that fanatic liberation is the Arat ideal. What is that ideal? Kind of erotic liberation. Arat liberation, fanatic liberation. But both are, both are, they lead to the, basically the same place. You don't suffer, everything is beautiful. They're equivalent in that sense. Yeah. I personally feel that, you know, I very much like this erotic stuff. I like helping others. But I also, through the lens of emptiness, I know that there is no intrinsic value in it. Like, it's, it's a fantasy. It's a beautiful fantasy. And I like this idea that I des- described yesterday. Big canvases, empty canvases of, of uh, like, yeah, big white empty canvases on which I can paint beautiful stuff. So much beauty, so much beauty. More and more beauty in various colors, lots of colors, like, you know the whole world like so much variety like a gift of love so much variety but i also understand yeah that in the view of emptiness one can just see oh blank canvas white white is the most beautiful of all no let it be white leave it at that white canvas very good destroy the canvas no no need need for a canvas either just no throw it away Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just find that find that that's fascinating. Like these these two two roots there, and I think like that's uh, I feel right now like like or like after yesterday, like you know, no wonder there's a schism between the Mahayana and the Theravada. I mean, they are very, I mean, they have the same basic point. They are both founded on some sense on emptiness, I think. But. Uh, yeah, one likes life, one doesn't. Equal, they're equal. But there is this one thing though that, that, that does come to my mind. The Buddha, of course, didn't just know out right away. So the Buddha also seemed to have cared. And I mean, here one question, who cares about the Buddha? Again, who cares about the Buddha? But, but still, like, you know, all we have are myths and, and descriptions and stories. In the view of emptiness, all of this stuff is just stories, you know, such as, you know, it doesn't have stories, but, you know, like, everything else we have is just this mental, this nama, this realm of stories and myths and fantasies and conceptions and so on. And I like this story of the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha st- stuck around to help, to help others. Yeah. It's an interesting mix of the two in some sense. In the old story, in the, Pali, in the story of the Pali Canon, the Buddha, uh, when he was around 30, he, uh, yeah, when he was around 35, he got awakened under the Bodhi tree. And his first idea was that, you know, was, uh, I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to get liberated right away. That's like, you know, yeah, I want to get liberated. I will do it right now. Like, relinquish everything. And the, the Pali Canon says that a Brahma, uh, this kind of, you know, the, basically the ruler of the universe, in 
some sense, of this particular universe. There are, may might be many Brahma realms, so like many universes ruled by many, many gods. But basically, Brahma in, in, in Theravada Buddhism is basically what we would, the creator god in some sense, the, the god of this universe, came down to the Buddha's level and, and, and told the Buddha, please stay and help others, others uh, awaken, please. There are those who have little dust, dust in their eyes, they can understand. Please stay and help them. And the Buddha decided to stay. So there is something yeah, kind of like, you know, apparently the Buddha in this myth, again just a myth, but in this myth, found some value in helping others, which would point kind of towards the Bodhisattva ideal. So then we again have the question, why help others just for this one lifetime and then know about if that was the point all along? <laughs> If you didn't find any value in sticking around and helping others like forever in the Bodhisattva ideal, like reincarnating again and again as a Tibetan Lama or something and you know, helping more and more people. Uh, yeah, if that wasn't the point at all, why didn't you just right away go to cessation? And yeah, interesting mix of the two there. I don't know, yeah, two routes to, to, to liberation, both equally equally valid, both work, both workable, both findable. This friend of mine I, I mentioned, Aditya, uh, maybe around a year ago or so, like eight months ago or so, he posted on stream entry, the subreddit, in, on Reddit, the subreddit of stream entry, that, hey, I'm an Arhat. Uh, I haven't talked to him personally since then. Uh, we had like some, some like on Discord or some, some small like in same conversations. But I haven't like had a chat with him. Just some messages. But he, uh, yeah, he said, yeah, I'm an Arat. And I'm kind of interested, you know, which, which route did he take? <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, yeah. This guy who knows how to get to prolonged cessation and so on. But he also says he likes sex. And that is kind of, you know, in the erotic side. Th that, that's like erotic liberation. Liking all these things, I don't know, yeah, also kind of, you know, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I might not have much more to say on, say on that, actually, so maybe, uh, just, you know, what do you think about this? Any, any thoughts? Because, like, I think that's all I had. I knew this was going to be a shorter talk than the others, and it was just like a finale. I just had to finish that stuff, you know. Yeah, okay. Um. So, are you saying that when you have an experience of suchness, your experience is completely unconditioned? Yeah, if, if you ex experience just suchness, yeah, it's un unconditioned. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't uh, have parts. How are you defining unconditioned? Because to me, unconditioned implies sort of containing nothing that has been learned since learning is a form of conditioning and at least if you put faith in materialist or theories of psychology if you see anything at all then that visual information has already gone through several layers of processing in your brain and your brain has learned how to do that processing so it's like conditioned information in a sense. Yeah. I feel I mean I mean unconditioned in the sense that if you experience just suchness, you are with the only object in your consciousness. In a sense, is suchness. That's the only concept that's going on. Mm. If it's an experience of pure suchness, it's just the only thing that's going on is this nothing else you know, mm. it's not differentiated and this is always just this mm. uh, and that's a very short answer like, it's shorter than your question but like that doesn't answer it you know? okay uh, yeah I guess I would just be skeptical of whether that's completely unconditioned since I suspect that even like maybe it's just semantics but like I suspect that uh, even in such a state, uh, like 
your prior experience still affects what you are experiencing? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, but yeah, that's maybe a, a different kind of of conditioning or like that's kind of yeah, maybe maybe it's a different way of using the words because like what I'm kind of meaning is that um, the experience and the well-being therein kind of rests on nothing but this one thing hmm. and this one thing is the world basically you know, like yeah this yeah so in in that sense unconditioned the, yes. the happiness therein mm. is unconditioned right yeah yeah okay. yeah so uh, actually that is a good that's a good specification yeah, it's about the happiness the bliss the liberation is unconditioned mm. yeah. but uh, uh i mean yeah I, I mean yeah because suchness has these laws and you know behaves it appears to change in this sense you know it, it's kind of you know uh, yeah any part of, of suchness at least that we look at is conditioned at least yeah I, um, I think that Buddha had the both possibilities. He just chose. He could have done the Arahat way or the Bodhisattva way. No, none of them was better than the other. And first he thought he would choose the Arahat way, but then he changed his mind and then he did the Bodhisattva way. And then he changed his mind again. Probably and the it was a new situation where he was thinking, which way shall I go? Yeah. No. Maybe he's just in the limbo, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still doing. Yeah, 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 still choosing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But of course, the the moment you you choose our way, it's done. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you really finally choose it, then it's it's done. Yeah, yeah. You basically, I mean, of course, it also depends on the metaphysics if you can come back. But basically, probably not, because then you're mm. you're if you only want this one one thing, this kind of bliss. You only want the good, and the only thing that's good is nothing. Then you know you're there, and you know you have it already. So like you know, there's no impetus, there's no no motivation to ever come back, basically. But, but these arahats who who are in the world, uh, don't they do good? I mean, in the Theravada tradition, don't the Theravada monks do good? It's, yeah, they, they they do good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do do good, which is uh, which is where the kind of uh, the complexity lies. Why care about others if caring about others is not valuable mm -hmm. and, and th th that's that's the original reason kind of basically why I didn't before yesterday I didn't even think that the cessation kind of path was um, you know that, that, that I, I felt that it, that it was somehow actually worse like r in some sense worse than the Bodhisattva way because, because I felt that um, I well, it didn't make sense in some way because yeah even the monks, even in Theravada, they like metta, they like compassion, yeah. and all of this stuff. So, so they have some positive value there. There's something positive. They, they, there's Quite they, much. Yeah, they, yeah, some beauty. They, they, they feel beauty in, uh, in something else than just cessation. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, yesterday I realized that yeah, if you go it the whole way and you only find beauty in cessation, that's completely coherent. There's no problem in that. But I agree, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like the monks and so on, and uh, they didn't quite do this in that very pure 100 percent just i'm just about nothing <laughs> the only thing i care about is just nothing uh didn't do it in that pure way yeah yeah um uh, just wondering so the thoughts are saying that this is just a dream so what's the point of uh trying to help others but what if those or the being still believe in that dream and then the suffering feels real as long as they are in that dream so yeah. is, is that like what maybe the bodhisattvas still mm -hmm. even though they know it's a dream but they want to help because these beings are believing in their dream full-heartedly like uh, I'm yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, believing in the suffering oh, it's, it, it is palpable somehow yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Uh, that is how what the Bodhisattva kind of vow goes, and how uh, the whole basis there, and why they say that arhats are, are selfish. But uh, yeah, and I thought, but yeah, yeah, last night I kind of realized that yeah, in the view of emptiness, it doesn't matter. Like it really doesn't matter. This you know the absolute perspective and the relative perspective. I actually have a friend who um, 
It's very difficult. Like at one point, I was like, he's a, he's a Tibetan Buddhist, like in the background. Uh, also has a is schizophrenic, uh, like has a diagnosis. Uh, but uh, he, um, at, at one point, he had he was very you know, he asked like, you know, what's wrong with suffering? What what what's wrong in 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 suffering? Like why would we want to get rid of of suffering? That me I suffer, others suffer. Why? What's the problem with it? And and that's kind of the absolute perspective in some sense. Yeah, there's nothing intrinsically bad about suffering either. You know, like it's it's it doesn't exist. It uh, that's, uh, you know it's an illusion. So the arhat could say, yeah, it's just an illusion. There is nothing bad is actually happening. So why help them? And then he knows out. It, it is it is valid. But the Bodhisattva says, you know, choose the other path. Yeah. Uh, the question about the cosmology of Buddhism, is that like the cessation considered, because I've been living in this idea of that, like, uh, well, the nothingness is the equal to everything. So, uh, is, it, is there any commentary on, on that? Because I I've been thinking that like the cessation, the idea of the cessation is becoming everything. Mm. Like, you become nothing, and in a way it's like, you know, every light casts a shadow, so to the play of, to the play of life, so you become everything that exists. So in that way, <coughs> I don't feel it's like nothing out, it's like the nothing yes. <laughs> it, it's a sort of, but I don't know what they're saying, the public camera. Or does they have anything else on that? It's just a, a description of the experience of the entire like, uh, like uh, uh, Yeah, I mean, th that's uh, like one description, uh, one interpretation of cessation of Nirodha is the cessation of suffering, cessation of craving. Not, not the cessation of everything, but the cessation of, of suffering. And I would argue that's closer to the Bodhisattva mm -hmm. idea. So like I, I, like that sounds to me like the Bodhisattva path, what you described basically. And there's a very kind of famous saying uh, by this kind of Hindu guru called Nisargadatta Maharaj, who said, "Wisdom says I am not. Love says I'm everything. Wisdom says I am nothing. Between these two, my life flows." And I, he probably did not mean it in in, in exactly this way, but it, this reminds me of that. Yeah. Mm. Love says I am everything. Love is the path. Like love is the is the bodhisattva way. You know, love is the essence of the bodhisattva liberation. Mm. And then you know, nothing is basically the essence of the arahat liberation. You know, there's the these two things there. Sorry, can I go off for just a bit? Yeah, of course. I'm interested in uh, the Mahayana, uh, the thoughts of of the higher realms of, of whatever you like. I once had this dream of cessation where it was cessation, but after I was in the in the Glossa room but everybody was controlling the dream. <laughs> you know, so maybe it's not the the higher beings <laughs> in the Mahayana tradition. <laughs> so the, is it that thought that like after you you know get get your way to the higher realms, they control things in, in this realm? Or did it like let the path to, to be a deity or what, what is that the thing like in Mahayana? Yeah, in, in Mahayana cosmology, like I'm not sure if they control every, control everything, but uh, yeah, definitely in Mahayana the idea is that uh, that yeah, when you die, you get into this first, you get into this thing called the bardo, the bardo state. There are several bardos, the betweens. Bardo kind of means an in between state. Uh, several, like I think there are like four. I, I haven't read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, so so I kind of the bardo third. All, I'm I think I should read it quite soon. I'm, I'm interested in it, but uh, I don't remember. Maybe four bardos or something. But um, yeah, you basically during that whole process, you basically choose where you want to reincarnate, where you want to go next. And uh, and uh, yeah, if you are a particular character, you want good for everyone. For example, you the, the thing you most want is that everyone is happy. You get to a place where everyone is happy. You know, if you sincerely honestly believe and want this you get you get there you know like into into a deva realm you know, into a, an angelic realm or you yeah or you can get reborn basically as this kind of ethereal like a bodhisattva yeah bodhisattva or or, or, or in vajrayana in tibetan, tibetan buddhism 
they have these all kinds of Buddhas. It's not just Shakyamuni Buddha, but they have, you know, for example, the, the four wisdom Buddhas. There's Amitabha, Ratnasambhava, Akshobhya, and uh, what's the last one, Demo, do you, do you remember? Anyhow, yeah, like uh, like they have these kind of wisdom Buddhas, all kinds of kinds of beings get reborn as one of these, and they have superpowers. That's the the idea there. So basically, they don't maybe control everything, but the cosmology in Mahayana is such that yeah, uh, the uh, you get, can get reborn in this uh, as this kind of ethereal kind of being, for whom people can you know they can pray for uh, for blessings, for example, and you can help them. So, for example, they are like Aval Avalokiteshvara, who is like a very famous Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. The Dalai Lama is said to be the reincarnation, like that basically that Avalokiteshvara, these Bodhisattvas can reincarnate several different beings at the same time, for example. They have such superpowers, and one of those incarnations is the Dal Dalai Lama. He's like an, yeah, an avatar of Aval Avalokiteshvara. The name means literally the Lord who looks down below. You know? The compassionate Lord who looks down at the at the, the subjects, basically. Um, and Avalokiteshvara, the mantra Om Mani Padme Hum. Mm. Some people might know that that's the mantra of Avalokiteshvara. It's like, a, like you know, I think it probably asks for peace and happiness in some sense from Avalokiteshvara. Just invokes it. So in Mahayana, they think that yeah, you can ask for these things, and, and then you they're brought to you. And honestly, interesting enough, there is this one one element there. Um, from our, you know, cultural st standpoint, uh, all of that sounds like nonsense. Most likely, for, for many people here in the West, you know. Sounds like nonsense. Bodhisattvas and Buddhas, you know, these special spiritual beings, you know, existing in some, in the kind of, uh, basically the realm between this suchness and the absolute, between Nirmanakaya, this, the the earthly body, we would say, the Dharmakaya, which is the absolute, between them is the Sambhogakaya, this, the bliss body, the bliss realm in some sense, they exist there somehow, in that layer. All that sounds like nonsense. But, you know, again, the subjective realm, Nama, very flexible. Mm. How do you interpret all that? For example, people who might, who, if there's people here who have taken psychedelics, for example, can get lots of visuals, all kinds of visu visions. Feels like contact, contacting entities. It feels like, you know, you have your eyes closed, it, it, it looks like there's a huge massive lion deity coming at you and, you know, just, you know, whispering things in your ear or communicating with you in, in, in some, some various ways. I, for, for example, once had an had ex uh, experience eight years ago. I had taken some ketamine and uh, I smoked TNT. Uh, and uh, I had this experience uh, I was like eyes closed in Portugal, in, in Porto, in this uh, Porto in Portugal, in a hostel bed, and uh, this massive insectoid, fractal <laughs> alien thing, you know, like it felt like the Divine Mother. It felt like, you know, Mom! <laughs> it's just this, this hugely compassionate being that felt like it was way bigger than I was, like, like appeared there and uh, kind of, you know, extend its kind of tendrils and its kind of appendages through me into my body and just kind of like transmitted this kind of telepathic message that, you know, just relax, I, like, I'm doing good, I'll, I'll fix you, just relax, relax, relax. And, you know, I felt like this, that, that her appendages went through me and kind of nudged things here and there, you know, like small muscles, things in my body, kind of energy body, like here and there, like, and then like, you know, done, this message is like, you know, I'm done, you know. Don't worry, don't worry, be happy, everything is fine, don't worry, be, be calm, this is, you know, like this kind of operation, but with this wonderful energy of compassion and love, and then it kind of just, you know, withdrew and disappeared into the blackness, and the trip was over. It was just, you know, just that. Experiences like that, for example, you know, you can interpret it as, in the realm of Nama, in the subject's realm, a part of my mind, you know, that, you know, is just this, this idea of a Divine Mother, for example. This psychological idea of a Divine Mother appeared in this, for whatever reason, as a fractal insect or alien thing, <laughs> who knows why, and, uh, and my mind kind of just healed itself, in some sense. Interpretation. Another interpretation, it was, some, it, it, it was a Buddha or something, you know, like it was a Bodhisattva. It was some, some kind of spiritual entity 
existing in that only in that realm of Nama, only in that subjective realm, not here at all, not in Nirmanakaya, not in this earthly realm, but somehow in that in Sambhogakaya, that bliss realm, in that that weird in between, that you know that that state, existing in that mental space, came to me, helped me, and however we interpret it, you know, like we don't have many reasons to interpret it one way or the other. It's, it's again something that you know science says nothing about you know simply nothing it doesn't science does not care about any of this stuff it's one of the I would say the kind of uh, core myths in uh, in Western society is the idea that uh, science has a world view there's a scientific world view but it's actually very narrow science does not say much about you know in many things many things are not just pseudoscientific or non-scientific they're extra scientific they're beyond it. Science is like, you know, that's not in my purview, I don't care, you know, and then, you know, I just do this thing. Uh, science works with empirical reality, it doesn't care about this stuff. So basically, there's so many things that science under underdetermines. It does not, you know, we don't have evidence, uh, no evidence, for one or the other. So we could interpret it however we want. Yeah. Could be Buddhas, could be archetypes, could be the collective unconscious, could be just my mind. One of the Christians have said that the Kaya is a similar cosmology um, that the yeah. Buddha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, uh, the Christian myth myth mythos, the Christian realm. The saints live on in heaven and they you can pray to them and they help you. Yeah. Same thing, you know. S interpretation. And emptiness is, yeah, from the view viewpoint of emptiness, it's kind of yeah. Maybe the subjective realm is so super fucking flexible, so flexible that you, you know it's it. What you believe it is, that's how it functions. If you believe in saints and stuff, saints appear to you. Voila. Or quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> or quantum mechanics. So I think I don't know. Is is it believe the saints or the superposition of electrons? So you know the like the, the quantum mechanics of physics. Yeah, but like, uh, do you do you say that those are somehow like two options? Yeah, no, that, that they're, they're, they're as hard to believe. Oh yeah, as hard to believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, as far out in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah th th that's true. Yeah, they don't compete. They're completely no, compatible. Yeah. yeah, and here too, you know, if you look at the, uh, of course, it's a good, good also observation that if you look at the, the uh, three biggest interpretations of quantum mechanics. You know, the many worlds interpretation that every moment the world is split into an infinite array of, of, of other universes if each one of them exactly as real as this one it's really really far out <laughs> the classical interpretation the standard inter the standard interpretation copenhagen interpretation consciousness conscious observation creates reality literally it collapses the super the supervision the wave function and basically Conscious observation is what really, like before conscious, conscious observation, nothing is anywhere, like, or like everything is everywhere. And when you look at it, then it's, uh, suddenly it, it just appears in one, one spot, but only after you look. So consciousness kind of decides what things actually are. Also super far out. The, the De Broly Bohm interpretation, um, a bit more cryptic, but basically uh, appeals to this, um, what's called the... Uh, Intricate reality, uh, you know, implicate, implicate reality, and you know, what are the words? Implicate and explicate, or intricate and extricate? No, implicate and explicate. Does someone remember? No. Does someone know? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, the divorce, yeah. In, in, in any sense, like basically rests on, on the idea that there's like um, there's um, like the world is basically like a, like a hologram that everything exists in every every spot all the time. That, that in every single part of reality, there's everything. Like everything exists in every spot. Every single pixel includes everything. Information about everything. Uh, and that's kind of like the, the holographic universe. Also super far out. It's basically the absolute. It means that, you know, God is everywhere. That basically says the same thing as, you know, it could be very easily interpreted in that way. Yeah, yeah this, what comes to my mind is the Buddha's uh, story of interest to uh, interest. Like network of two 
too. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. Uh, yes. Yes. Really like through, uh, as being like uh, his description of quantum physics, you know, yeah. or how ev every or everything, uh, this uh, things on the other side of the universe are connected and yeah. And like and but but like yeah, and it's, it's really interesting how he yeah. uh, also described this now uh, pretty far out. Yeah, exactly. Science, yeah, uh, totally. concepts that we find now in science. Yeah, yeah. Uh, already, like just through. I mean, the only thing is that he knew it, I guess, just through his <laughs> lens, own lens, not not observing with any any tools or or, or tool of his own being. Or yeah. Uh, yeah. Not any scientific tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is fascinating. Like, yeah. Yeah, the, the probably bomb interpretation is very close to Indra's net. Yeah. And he even talked about subatomic particles, apparently, that uh, some. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. You mean the, the Kalapas? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. It was going to talk about that in, in the video center retreat also, I think. And so yeah. How, how, yeah. Then the, how the difference between scientists who found out about the atomic particles. The difference between him and Buddha is that one is suffering and one is uh, I mean one is liberated and one is still suffering after finding out atomic particles. Yeah. Yeah. that that's that is yeah that that's that's yeah I, I also remember one of one of one of Cuenca's stories yeah for sure. <laughs> and it's uh, yeah it is it is fascinating how uh, how much parallels there are there. Uh, you know, for example, it's also this, you know everything springs from the void, which is a very classical, very very old religious idea, mystical idea. And uh, now we have, for example, yeah, the De Broglie Bohm uh, interpretation, for example, it it um, includes this idea of yeah, and other interpretations to some degree as well. Yeah, the zero point field that the void has massive amounts of energy. You know, there's like in in one you know cubic centimeter of just void, there's like so like astronomical amounts of energy for example which is kind of uh, has a similar like similar tone to it in some sense and 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 the idea that you know the big bang sprung you know there's like just quantum decoherence random decoherence in like in the quantum like fluctuations in the zero zero point field in the in the in the energy field of, of the void just random fluctuations suddenly bursting like started kind of you know resonating with each other and creating matter. That's basically the scientific picture of, 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 of the birth of the universe. Very simplified, of course, but basically this. Random quantum fluctuations in the zero-point field started out the Big Bang, out of nothing. And it's, it's interesting how close it is to something like just, you know, Genesis. <laughs> First there was the word, you know, and then you know, from nothingness there suddenly came something and everything springs from the void and so on. All of that is, that is interesting, but of course it does not concern um, um, liberation as such anymore. And and this is maybe the point where the Buddha said that you know, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a physician. <laughs> I I teach only suffering and the end of suffering, and that is what the talk also was basically about. These two ways to suffering, you know, the cosmology undecidable, and that's kind of you know also one of the great findings I think in, in Buddhism is exactly this back to emptiness it's undecidable we don't have evidence we can't decide it's and because of that it's so super super flexible yeah and it might even be such that this subjective realm like the interpretation like reality is such that it really can accommodate several interpretations that are exactly as true but at the same time it can be real or exactly as unreal that there's a mind, an unconscious mind, and you know, parts of the mind and so on, a collective unconscious mind, archetypes and so on, bodhisattvas and buddhas, demons and angels, saints and sinners, and hell and heaven, whatever, devil realms and everything, might be that all of that is true at the same time, because it's so flexible, who knows. As a curiosity, some people have made experiments to try to figure out whether DMT entities are real by asking them questions that the person 
themselves doesn't know the answer to, but unfortunately the entity tends to give answers like, it's below my position to answer such questions. Yeah, that's really wild. Like, the, the, yeah, entities in, in psychedelic experiences, for example, they are very fascinating but they can always be interpreted as just parts of the mind or, uh, or this or this or that. Yeah. So that is kind of, it's up for grabs. It's open to interpretation and I think there's, it's, it's very important not to lose sight of that because that's where the liberation is, is in this openness of interpretation, not clinging to the truth. Like I said in the first talk, truth is not important because it's so open to interpretation. No, we should not try to find the one single truth because there might not be one single truth. And if you endlessly try to pursue it, you will most likely end up in tangles and will suffer. Well, obviously, I mean, it, it, it is also possible to just get rid of suffering, be liberated, and then start thinking about the cosmology stuff, uh, which I'm kind of looking forward to. <laughs> and like, like, to some degree doing already because like uh, like um, yeah I mean it's, it's just fascinating and nice to play with but uh, but yeah not to lose sight of emptiness that you know liberation comes from this flexibility so there's something to cherish in the flexibility and Robert Bea who again like you know all my veneration to him he was a group like apparently by all reports and you know just his tone of voice and everything and you know the way he writes and speaks such a great, great human, human being, and I'm so sorry to have missed him, uh, never to have met him, but um, uh, he says that uh, in one of his talks he extols, like, wandering. Keep on wandering, kind of, you know. There's a beauty in that kind of endless wandering, you know, always open to new interpretation. You know. Like, all of this stuff, you know, doesn't have to get fixed. If you need to have it fixed, that's a problem. Again, because there's the idea of flaw, and you will suffer. If you're, if you're like, no, I'm not finished until I have the one sole interpretation of reality. I need it. You suddenly have the idea of need, requirement, lack, flaw, suffering. You need it. But if you do it just as a hobby, so to say, you know, like you just, you know, if you you don't really think that it's so important you know you don't you, you're, you don't despair for the truth or whatever of course you can explore and stuff but it's it's good to keep this in mind yeah to be satisfied very important to be satisfied with that restless wandering forever wandering because otherwise you will suffer yeah yeah Not quite late yet, so like you know, does someone have something to say still, or should we just call it quits and just sit? It will be one more, no, it's still 50 minutes, so it is gonna be a much more robust sit than the others leaving sits, and I'm sure you know there might be some aversion, <laughs> <laughs> some suffering at the thought that there will be a 50 minute sit, but maybe this is a good time to end. Maybe